Mi nombre es Anabela Martínez y soy la directora del Centro para la Excelencia Docente acá en el Minorte. Agradecemos su participación y su asistencia en el día de hoy. Vamos a dar inicio al taller que nos ha preparado la doctora Elizabeth Barrio. Y como de los que están aquí, que asistieron a la jornada de ayer y escucharon la intervención de la doctora Barrio, se dieron cuenta que ella realmente eh, en sus eh, exposiciones eh, conecta mucho la teoría con la práctica. Así que eh, lo que vamos a hacer en el día de hoy en este taller es realmente eso. Y para comenzar, eh, vamos a ir trabajando en algunos de, de, de los comportamientos que vemos en nuestros estudiantes. Eh, como por ejemplo, cuando vemos que nuestros estudiantes siempre se sientan atrás, en nuestros salones, ¿verdad? Entonces los invitamos, por favor, a todos eh, los docentes y el, el, los invitados que tenemos que están atrás, que por favor se sienten acá adelante, que tenemos bastante espacio. Este es un taller, realmente va a tener un enfoque muy práctico. Ustedes van a estar participando en una serie de actividades durante la mañana. Entonces es muy importante que, eh, porque estén acá en estos puestos de adelante, igualmente van a hacer bastante trabajo en grupo, hay mucho trabajo colaborativo. Entonces es importante que queden juntos, sentados juntos con otras personas para que puedan hacer ese trabajo. Entonces les damos unos minuticos para que por favor se reubiquen. de California, eh, su área disciplinar es Historia de la Música, lo cual es realmente muy interesante eh, si, si pensamos eh, en, digamos en el perfil de muchas de estas personas que trabajan eh, todo el tema de la pedagogía universitaria, el tema de la enseñanza aprendizaje a nivel universitario, son personas que realmente no están formadas necesariamente como educadores o pedagogos, sino que tienen, eh, están, vienen de distintas disciplinas académicas. Su tema de investigación ha sido por muchos años el tema de, de conectar a los estudiantes con sus metas de aprendizaje a través del aprendizaje colaborativo. Es autora de varias publicaciones eh, relacionadas con el trabajo colaborativo. Una publicación reciente que ella tiene que es sobre técnicas para promover la participación de los estudiantes. El tema del engagement, que fue el tema que se trabajó en la, en la intervención que hizo ella ayer y por su labor realmente ha recibido varios reconocimientos, entre los cuales se destaca un profesor del año en, en California, dado por la Fundación Carnegie para el avance de la enseñanza. Algo muy interesante de Elizabeth es que si bien ella se dedica a todo el tema de la consultoría eh, en, a nivel de, de educación, ella es, sigue siendo docente, ella sigue dando clases, sigue estando en el aula de clases, y estábamos conversando ahorita de eso, sobre la importancia que tiene para trabajar en este tipo de temas, de que eh, estemos todavía muy conectados con lo que está sucediendo en el aula para realmente poder eh, ver, eh, digamos, la relación y la pertinencia de lo que eh, viven los docentes día a día en sus aulas. Entonces, sin más preámbulo, pues le damos a ella las gracias por estar acá con, con nosotros, eh, por aceptar nuestra invitación, es su, la primera vez que viene a, a Colombia y le damos las gracias a ustedes por su participación. Uh, gracias, doctora Martina. Uh, buenos días a todos. Bienvenidos. Gracias por estar aquí. Quisiera por desarrollar, mm, <laughs> desarrollar este tema en español. Gracias por su paciencia y disposición para participar de este taller, que espero sea de mucho provecho para ustedes. Wow. 
one of the first things I'm going to do when I return to the United States is study Spanish. <laughs> um, I believe uh, many of you were at the keynote yesterday morning, and thank you for coming back. For those of you who were not there, I will review some of the basic principles because, as Dr. Martinez explained, my hope and intent is to connect theory to practice because I understand many of you are in the classroom. So to remind um, those of you who were here yesterday and to tell those of you who weren't, I have been in the classroom teaching for over 30 years. But for a period of about 10 years, I worked in administration as a dean. And after I had been working as an administrator for those many years, I asked to go back to the classroom because I wanted to focus back again on teaching. And I showed this picture yesterday morning of what the students looked like when I came back to teach. I had been a very popular teacher many years earlier, but in the 10 years that I was in administration, I believe that the students change. And my experience was that many of them seemed not to want to be in my classroom. One of the things that we have in the United States is something that is called Great High Professor. And I don't think you have that here in Colombia. But in the United States, someone started an internet program where students are allowed to rate their college professors. And they have now expanded this to all levels of education. And students rate and comment about their instructors so that everyone can see. It's very threatening to many professors. And I will show you an example of some from my college. And you can see that some professors have received bad ratings. This is just one of many reasons why I was concerned about my students not liking me and not working well in the classroom. And it got worse for me personally after I returned. I was called into the new dean's office, the dean who replaced me, and he read a whole page of complaints from particularly unhappy students. Since I was too young to retire, I decided I better look carefully at how I was working in the classroom because I wanted to continue teaching. I want to share with you a story from a colleague of mine. This isn't really his picture, but it captures a little bit his personality. He is considered, he's actually the editor of a very famous United States journal on education. And he used to criticize some of the things that I did in the classroom. And I didn't like it because I said, you have no right to criticize me until you have spent time in a classroom. So he decided he would 
go back and try teachings. He took an adjunct or part-time professor position at a local university and taught one class. He spent months preparing for that class. I think in his heart, he was hoping and planning that the students would so love him that they would rush to rape my professor and they would say he was the best professor they ever had and that rape my professor would have to come up with a new category to show how excellent he was perhaps a smoky chili pepper to show how caliente, how hot he was. So I was very interested when I received an email from him after he had been teaching for one month. The title of that email was Read It and Read It. I'm going to share with you one small paragraph. Right. Now, I want to tell you in advance that in the United States, professors and teachers think this is pretty funny. I don't know if you will think it's funny, but my point is to show how hard it is to actually teach. So here is from his email. Teaching, why does anyone try? My semester has been hugely disappointing. I went into it believing that students would feel my enthusiasm, respect my intelligence, and want to share Oh. Da, 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 da. I hear that in my classroom. <laughs> uh, individual students don't get me started, as it is likely to reveal in me strong emotional forces tempting me into using my gifts for language in the service of a pettiness destined to erode the moral character I've spent a lifetime trying to build on. I feel like a total failure and doubt I will ever teach again. And when I read that, in the United States we have a kind of a response and it's this. Yes! I was so happy to see that he thought he knew how people should teach. But when he went into the classroom, he found a much more challenging world than he had ever expected. Teaching today is very, very difficult. But being a student, and when we think of all of the stimulations our younger people experience in their regular lives, when they come to one of our classrooms, many of them do not find it interesting. But some of those students don't get involved because they're bored. Other students, because they can't keep up. And the look is much the same, isn't it? So that puts kind of a bad character on students. But let's talk about college professors and high school teachers. This is a joke in the 
United States. How many teachers or professors does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is change. Because the reputation in the United States is that especially college professors don't change and are teaching the same way that they were taught. But I propose that those of you who are here today respond differently. You are looking for ways to change and you see it as possible. And I commend you for your efforts. Yesterday, I shared a quote from an historian, and he said, in times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with the world that no longer exists. That is so true today. Those of you who are here are learners today, and I commend you for being here. When I went back and I changed the way that I was teaching, I want to show you how the enrollment in my class changed. In 1994 to 95, I had about 45 students for the whole year. In my institution, we say students vote with their feet. They choose the teachers and the classes from the ones that are available. And this shows how my class grew. It grew so much that I now have a team of teachers which is why I'm able to be here with you today. So I have three main goals for us today. The first is to reinforce your understanding of the theoretical model that I hope will help you to look at teaching and learning in your own context and help you solve your problems. Secondly, to expand and deepen your learning and understanding about that model and about teaching and learning. And then this is what is most important today. We are going to build what I call a knowledge repository that will contain ideas for you to take back to your own classes in your own individual context. I ask you not to be miser. You have lots of experience. You know your own situation. You have come up with creative ideas. Share those. And at the end of the workshop, we will collect all those ideas that are written down. And the staff at uh, Universidad de Norte will write them down and send them back to me. So it is a very good thing for you to contribute. We will have a break at around 10 o'clock. But I also encourage you, uh, you won't get donuts, but you will get coffee. I encourage you, if you need to get up and use the facility or the restroom, do so during the group work or even when I'm speaking. Uh, feel comfortable today. You are here by choice. I appreciate your being here. I don't want you to feel like you can't move. So move as you need, but we will have a break. 
Now, Dr. Martinez, as to the form groups, I would prefer that you would be in groups of about five, because that's small enough to share ideas. So can you please make sure that you now are with people about five, and you can turn around to the people behind you, however you want to do it, but also give some space so that you aren't hearing the other groups. So groups of about five. What I would like you to do in each group, I want you to decide who has fought the longest, and that person will help facilitate the discussion. And whoever has fought the smallest, you are going to write down on the paper. Okay, so now introduce yourself and determine who has talked longest and who has talked shortest so that you can have the two roles. Give you a couple minutes for that. In my classes, for the horse, in my classes, and I'm sure in your classes, it's difficult to get students who are talking together to come back with the group. I have so much that I want you to do today. I need to ask your help. When we come back as a group, I will say, por favor, and I'll raise my hand, and that means please help each other come back to talk through as a group. I have so much to do today that if we are efficient, we'll be able to do all of it. But if we are not efficient, I'll cut some of it out. So the first thing that I would like you to do is to go around in what I call a round table. Colt stands for collaborative learning technique and it comes from one of my books. So these techniques are not my invention. They come from teachers. But I pulled them together in a book and described them and named them. So in a round case, it is a technique where in a group, you each say your contribution one right after another. For example, in this group here, this gentleman would speak and that woman, and you would go around as though you were in a table. What I would like you to do in that round table, and the facilitator should help this, is say, one of the problems I face is getting students to and then what is one of the problems? For example, in the United States, one of the big problems is getting students to stop using their cell phones during class. I don't know what your problems are, but each person should identify a problem. Sometimes it is to get students to do something. Sometimes it is to get students to stop doing something. You decide. Don't try to solve the problem now. At the end of the workshop, we will come back and solve the problem. Right now, just as succinctly and shortly as possible, go around and identify the problems that you face. The person who is the recorder, the youngest teacher, you write down those problems on a piece of paper. Okay? Make sense? I'm going to give you five minutes for this. Five minutes. So talk around and describe your problems. Many teachers find that today's young people are so 
moving fast, they can set some time. Excellent. Another problem, please. Buenos días. Nos hemos encontrado en este grupo, somos docentes de diferentes niveles. Preescolar, primario, bachillerato. Y el problema eh, en común es la falta de colaboración de los padres de familia. Los padres de familia pretenden obtener resultados favorables de los estudiantes, sin embargo no están apoyando la labor que nosotros como docentes estamos realizando. Is quick to criticize and say you should solve this and teach these new students, but they don't provide support outside. So I think we will ask for one more problem uh, and then we will collect the papers. But one more problem in the back, I see there. We're here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, yes. Bueno, nosotros encontramos eh, problemas que están entrelazados. Realmente son varios, pero son consecuencias uno del otro. Que es la apatía por la lectura. Y eso es, trae como consecuencia, por supuesto, la comprensión de la lectura y la misma redacción. ¿no? O sea, realmente son tres problemas ligados. Iniciando con la apatía a la lectura. Another excellent problem. Um, I see that there are more people who are willing to contribute, and I appreciate that. But so that we can keep moving, we won't take the time to explore all of that. Uh, but we are collecting now all the papers. If you pass all the papers either this way or this way, pass this way. They will collect them, and then we are going to solve as many of those problems as we can later in this workshop. If you don't know where you're going, how will you know when you get there? I want to talk about the phrase student engagement. I believe from Dr. Martinez that you don't have an equivalent concept in Colombia. But that phrase is used extensively in the United States and in Europe, Australia, South Africa. And the question is, what does it mean? What is student engagement. When I began to write the book, I looked to the literature. And the, in the United States, there is a national survey on student engagement. And they define engagement as the frequency with which students participate in effective educational practice. From my perspective as a teacher, that wasn't very helpful in the classroom. It was too general. Another scholar pointed out that people use the term but what is actually meant by it was not clear. And then a third scholar noticed that when people say student engagement, they're actually thinking different things. So there wasn't agreement when I wrote the book on what was student engagement. I guess it would be better if I stand over here, maybe. So I talk to college faculty, because I'm in college. I know some of you are not. But some of the issues that we face are the same. 
but I'm coming from a college professor. Professor said, to get students engaged, they need to be motivated. In this group here, they said the students were interested in learning how to read. That motivation, my feeling, is if they're not interested, I say, you are a good student if you look to see if your questions are already answered in the documents before asking me. Many of my students just jump to ask me a question without looking to see if it isn't already answered. I say, you are a good student if you manage your time well and don't ask for extensions on the deadlines. I never, ever give them, so don't even ask. I say, you are a good student if you read the assignment directions carefully, not only will you get a better grade, but you will learn more. And finally, I say you are a good student if you don't argue over your grade. What this helps me do is that it helps me reward all those students who have these kinds of behaviors. And if a student comes in halfway through the term and says, I want a higher grade, I think you did not give me the grade that I deserve, I can say, well, I'm happy to talk with you about that if you want, but do you really want to learn, lose your good student bonus? And then they say, oh no, and they go away. So I feel better. I also have something called a junk effort penalty because I was so angry at students who would turn in material that they had spent no effort on. It was insulting to me. So I wrote in the syllabus, if you have disregarded the basic directions, put no level of thought, all of these problems, you get minus 200 points. Recently, I was at a college uh, graduation, and the professor who spoke, selected by the students, was one who said that when he used to, he was an, a philosophy professor, and if he got a paper that was poorly written and looked like they had not spent any effort, the joke kind of was that he would burn it in his office and put the ashes and the match into an envelope and give it back to the That was his version. But I just give a 200 point penalty. And I also say, I will also take away your good student bonus. So, what I have found is that my courses are complex systems of rewarding good behavior and punishing poor behavior. That has its roots in the earliest motivation models. They want to avoid the punishments, but they don't care about the learning itself. That's what we train people to do. There are other models of motivation. Needs models were also popular, and Maslow's was the most famous. And Maslow says that the first level of basic physiological needs, like that you are not hungry, that you are well fed, that you have slept, that has to be met before you can move to the top, which is engagement and interest in learning. So you know if your students come in and haven't eaten, it's hard for them to concentrate because that's basic. But in the middle here is love and belonging and esteem. It's more subtle, but it means that a student must feel comfortable to say what they really think and feel before they will say it.
because they need to protect their ego and their self esteem. There are many models of motivation, but contemporary theorists say that most models of motivation can be summarized as being the product of value times expectancy. So value is that in order to be interested, you have to think it's worth knowing or learning. And expectancy is that you have to believe with effort you can do it. If one of those elements are missing, or is missing, you cannot be motivated. So let's look at value first. Value in the classroom is both what they're learning and how they're learning. So, as I said yesterday morning, many students, even in college, but also, I would imagine, in kindergarten through the preparatory for college, is they are taking your classes only because they are required to, not because they want to. So here are some ways I've promoted value in my own teaching. I created something that I call empowering students as architects of their own learning. And so in my classes, I've identified what they need to learn. And then I give them different ways to achieve that. Now that doesn't work in all classes, but it works in my class. One of the problems that many teachers have told me is that even when they have a group discussion, only one or two or three students will speak up. The rest will be quiet. So I'm going to ask you to do something here called a think, pair, share. And this involves three steps. I want you to think for a moment. Just think, don't talk. Why is it sometimes hard to get students to participate in a whole class discussion? Just think for yourself. Now, if you don't have a whole class discussion, you might think, how, what, what problems do you have, or why do you think students aren't participating in a whole activity? Now, second, I'd like you to pair up in twos. You'll decide who's A, who's B, and A will start talking. B just listens. And then I'll say switch, and then B will speak to A. Is that clear? OK. So A, tell B why you think it is sometimes hard to get students to participate. And the purpose is to help students think quietly their response and I would quote Dallin Hart, who is a country singer in the United States, and she said, I'm not offended by dumb, blonde, and jokes. First of all, I know I'm not dumb. And second, I know I'm not blonde. <laughs> so, <laughs> so as you watch this video, I want you to look for matches between theory and practice. I was teaching the students about the urban folk revivals, which is a movement of music in the 1960s in the United States that most of my students, I realized, didn't know. So instead, I asked them, I realized my more important goal was for them to understand the political uses of music. So I started there. They had cameras in my classroom, 
and then they ask students, how did it feel to be part of that St. Pair Share? How did that help you? And you will also see the students respond. Teachers know that provocative discussion is a powerful teaching strategy, yet it is difficult to get all students to participate effectively. Good discussion requires students to speak up and say what they truly think, feel, and believe, and many students are reluctant to take this risk. They are afraid to look stupid if their comments are viewed as incorrect or inappropriate. Speaking up is difficult for newer first-generation college students, and it is particularly risky for ESL students who are embarrassed about their accents or fear they'll use the wrong words or that people won't understand them. It's the different teaching style from American and Asian. We are not speaking for 10 years during our um, high school and primary school. So this is like becoming a habit. Well, along with being able to convey your ideas, you also get to meet new people in the class. And the more people you meet, the more comfortable you feel to be able to speak up. When I moved back to the US, I had the top English ESL class and I was just so shy, you know, the teacher just talked to me and my first just my face just turned red and I was like, uh oh. Like for those ordinary discussion, every time like teacher the instructor asks us to think and share, I know I'm not gonna share in class, so I'm not gonna think like for this. This activity thing for chair, I know I'm going to say something to the person next to me, so it gives me some motivation to really think about the question. It's hard for me to talk in front of groups, but when you talk to a partner and you kind of learn their ideas, you feel like you have to share their idea. You kind of overcome your own anxiety because you've learned something. And I think this is more progressive as far as having different ethnicities and different age groups and classrooms and stuff. And all these experiences come together. With this time that uh, teachers allocate to just the things that encourages you know to form your opinions and your thoughts um, about the particular subject at hand. My class is full of these kinds of students, so I'm using a collaborative learning technique known as Think, Pair, Share. In this film clip, I will have been lecturing on the urban folk revival. I'll stop lecturing, pose a question, and ask students to take a few moments to think about an answer. Then I'll tell them to pair up to discuss their answers before sharing with the entire class. Hence, think, pair, share. This quote reduces the risk associated with discussion because it gives students time to clarify their thoughts and rehearse their comments before speaking up in the whole class. My learning goal here is for students to recognize the political power of music and to help give that power personal significance by asking students to relate it to their own lives. When music was used as a political purpose during the civil rights movement, they sang the song We Shall Overcome, which gave black Americans uh, the self-confidence and self-esteem that they needed to stand up and fight. I come from, from Jordan, uh, the singer uh, has to sing about the queen and the king of Jordan to encourage people to fall in love with them. Uh, Marvin Gaye, the album called uh, What's Going On, uh, it carries a political message. Uh, it's talks about drug abuse, poverty, uh, environment, political corruption, and also uh, it carries the anti-Vietnam War message. Uh, during uh, the Cold War, I used to be in a country with a socialist uh, regime. Uh, Ethiopia, which is, and uh, they used to have like, they used to teach us in kindergarten and up uh, international, which is the national anthem for Soviet Union, and you know, it's like ingrained now, I can, I can say it to you basically until now. Like during uh, slavery, when the plantation owners took the drums away from the slaves, so they could communicate among each other and send messages and stuff. Excellent idea, I love these connections that you are all making. Things pair share is not typically graded. However, I do grade it using a variation of another code called dialogue journals. I ask students to organize all their lecture and discussion notes into an in-class portfolio and submit this to me for grading three times a term. I review their portfolio and assign grades based on the quality and quantity of their in-class work. 
For example, for St. Pierre Share, I read what they wrote regarding their own thoughts as well as what they learned from their partner and the whole class discussion. It's an excellent way to meet women because you get to know them and get a little one-on-one -on -one basis with them, you know. Do a little group study with them, you know. And maybe later on you get to hook up with them later. We'll see. So, uh, yes, I'm glad that some of you uh, were able to see that, that that nice student at the end who liked group work because it helped to meet women. Uh, but, uh, so, you will know for yourself what the evidence was. But I think and hope that you saw that students found value in the question and that they felt comfortable about speaking up. One of the most interesting responses to me was the Asian woman who said, in ordinary classes, when the teacher says, okay, what did you, I'm gonna ask you what you thought about this. She said, I know I'm not going to say anything. So I don't even think. <laughs> I thought, my goodness, I had not even thought of that before. So what we're going to do now is to start constructing that knowledge repository. And what I would like you to do is to share some of your ideas on helping students value what they're learning. And I will ask you to put this in on a grid. Each group will get one grid. Oh, please. You will share ideas, and the recorder will write those ideas down only on that top row. We're going to answer seven different prompts through the rest of the workshop. So right now, just write on that very top line. And then if you need more space, you can go to the back and just number it as number one so that when the people transcribe it, they can see where it belongs. Does that make sense? So what I'm asking you to do is to generate ideas on how you help students value what they're learning. Dr. Martinez, said, do you want to elaborate or? Uh, do you have any questions? Okay. Then I'm going to give you uh, only five minutes, so you have to be efficient. Generate ideas on how you help students value. Now, una por grupo. Por grupo. Ella lo ve una por grupo. Sí, lo mismo. Creo que la cara. That's based on their past experience, 
It's also based on their personal sense of self-confidence, and it's based on the perceived difficulties of the test. So it's complex, but even if a student values what they're doing, if they don't think they can be successful, they won't be motivated. So I want to share and review again some models of expectancy that someone from University of California at Berkeley found. He said that there are success-oriented students, and this is in all levels of education, who believe they will be successful and have high expectations that whatever you tell them to do, they will be able to do it. There are overstrivers who have not always been successful. Maybe they have a learning disability. Maybe they have been in not very good classes. But they still want to succeed, so they make sure that they do all the work necessary to succeed. But they're anxious and nervous that something will happen and they'll fail again. They push us for higher grades. Failure avoiders are students who have had more problems. And so they also want to succeed. But the way they succeed is by not taking any risks. They want us to tell them precisely what to do. They do not challenge themselves. They do only what is required so that they don't fail. And then there are failure accepting students. And these are students who have had so many problems. They have not been successful before. They don't expect to be successful now. And in some of our classes at all levels in the United States, we have these students, and they are almost impossible to motivate because you are working against their whole history in education. So it's interesting to think how you were as a student and to see what patterns you see in your own students. But expectancy is complex. Is it due just to a student's lack of confidence? generally about themselves as a human being? Or is it contextual? I had a student who was a very good, what we call a break dancer, but he wasn't good in school. So when I had him come up and talk about and show how he danced, he was very motivated and very happy. So sometimes it's the classroom itself. I shared yesterday, but want to remind you of two things, or one thing that I do in my classes. Before I knew the theory, I would always say thank you for being in this class. I've had many students who are successful, and I expect that you will be successful too. I didn't realize this, but I'm addressing students' expectancy when I say that. If you tell your students, with effort, you will succeed you're addressing expectancy, especially in college. We have teachers who pride themselves that their classes are so tough. 50% of the students will be. They take that as a point of great personal glory. But that immediately scares most students. The successful oriented students will rise to the challenge, but the rest will find that their motivation is threatened because it affects expectancy. In my own teaching, I said how I allow students to create their own learning path. In my grading system, I have more points available than I needed for, for a good grade. And so I tell students they can choose, but the number of points that are available start deteriorating as the term progresses. But I want to share from an anonymous survey what some students said. 
One student said, in most of my classes, you accumulate points. But in order to get an A, you need almost all the points. My other classes have a very slim margin to mess up. If you miss points on something early, it is so demotivating. In this class, you stay motivated to learn and work hard because success is up to you. Without knowing it, my system was addressing expectancy. This is another college student. I don't know who these students are, but this is what they wrote. The accumulative point system is something I have never had in a class before. I love it because I really feel in charge. For example, my psychology class has two tests, a midterm and a final, each is 50%. I'm worried that if I'm sick or tired, I won't be able to demonstrate my true knowledge. In this class, that never crosses my mind, and I feel confident. Again, without knowing it, I was addressing students' expectancies. Here are some other examples of expectancies. A math teacher uses one of the SET and for student engagement techniques, and it comes from another one of my books. And so what they do is that they put the students into groups, and the group look at a sample process for solving that's the first step. The second step is that they're given a new set of problem solutions, but in which there is an error, and they are required to find where is the error. Then the third stage is groups are given a new problem and asked to solve it themselves. And the final stage is that then they go individually and are asked to solve the problem. Now, you have to be creative. You may look at these and say, I don't teach math, or I don't teach math at the college level, but you're smart and you're creative, and so all of these ideas are things that you think about and maybe you could modify them for your own context. But the main idea here is to break it in steps so that students are supported and then can expect that they will be successful. One other, I won't go into another one, but now your challenge is to go to the grid again and now on number two, share ideas. What are ideas to help students accept that with effort, they will succeed. Is there any questions? Let me, let me just explain that again, your purpose is what do you do, or what could you think of doing to help students think that with effort, they will succeed. I'll share one more example. If students are allowed to turn in papers when they are drafts and not complete for grading until they get it right, that is the way that some English teachers or language teachers help in exchange. Okay, so five minutes, and if you have questions, wave your hands, and I'm sure that uh, someone else will be able to answer them if not me. So on number two, these ideas, five minutes. And I, when I heard her say that, I thought, really? And I went back and looked. And it is just evidence that different people see different things. During the break, uh, several people came up and talked to me. And I want to make a comment. They asked, I'm going to say, share two things. One was, how applicable is all of this throughout all the levels of education? I think it is all applicable. 
it all applies just in different ways. Even a five-year-old, even a five-year-old needs to find what they're doing interesting and a value, or they won't do it. They won't be motivated to do it unless they're forced to, and then they're not being motivated. Another question that I had, and this is also a problem in the United States, is why bother with education? If I could make money easier by being a criminal or a gangster, or if I could make money easier by starting a new company in electronics or something. So we're challenged, and I know you're challenged, to help students see the value of their education. And that's tough. But for example, when I have students, and I do have students, who think that it would be easier to make money if they were just criminals, I say, do you really want that kind of life of violence for yourself and for your family? And so, do you, I try to help them imagine what they want their life to be. And I also try to help them see the problems of the whole world and say, be part of the solution, not part of the problem. But the challenge is still there. They have to value education more than the alternatives. And maybe you won't be able to get some of them to see that. But that's still what they need to see if you are going to motivate them. So thank you for all of your interest and your participation. So let's move on to learning. We store information by similar connections. And then we retrieve it by how that information is But if we're looking for an individual, we will look to see how does that individual look different from the rest of the crowd. That's how we store and we retrieve information. Now, to give you an example, in my own discipline of music, those of you who read music know that we have whole notes and whole tones. Whole notes are how long a pitch lasts. Whole tones are the distance in physical, acoustical vibrations between the two. Very different. But students often confuse these two. And if you look, you see how similar. One person pointed out that notes and tones have the same four letters. So when we are teaching, when we are teaching things that are similar, it is important to help students see what the differences are. A common mistake, as I'm sure you know, in my country, is to spell Colombia C-O-L-U. That is because we have many cities and schools in the United States called Colombia, and they're spelled that way. I had to have someone point out there is an O in Colombia, the country. And then I could see the difference, and I won't make that mistake again. So we store by similarity. We retrieve by differences. I shared this story yesterday, but let me explain it again. Because some of what we learn and know most about learning is when we study how we ourselves learn as human beings. 
So I was walking with my sister in Hawaii, and she said, look at the birds. And I said, oh, hand me the microphone. Now that makes no sense. But my sister understood that what I was really needing was handing the binoculars. Because she's my sister. And when you look at these two, both of them make things amplified. But one is vision, the other is hearing. So I store them in the same network and retrieve them incorrectly. We call that the right roar, but the wrong file syndrome. And when our students make errors, this is a common error. And if you watch yourself in everyday life, when you struggle for a name or a word or whatever, and it's wrong, it probably has some similarity to the correct answer. You just pulled the wrong thing. And it's more helpful to our students if they can start to think and learn why they made the mistake instead of just that wrong. Because they made that mistake for a reason. So connecting learning in other disciplines at my college, we have a microbiology teacher, and when she, she has four classes, but when they have questions, instead of immediately answering them herself, she says, I think you already know enough information to answer that question. Go in pairs and see if you can figure it out yourself and then she brings them back to the whole class. Yesterday's keynote with the university, they talked, one professor, about using clickers. And I, clickers are where students are given an electronic device, and Professor Dennis Jacobs at the University of Notre Dame completely changed his chemistry class by giving students stickers, uh, clickers, and he would do experiments up here, and for example, ask students to predict what the response would be. And then he would do the experiment, and it was able to have students continuing to rely on what they already knew to solve new problems. So your third challenge here on whatever level you are teaching, is how do you help students correctly connect new learning to what they already know? And that will be number two. Okay? Any questions? Okay, so back to this question. What are ideas for helping students make connections? I would like to hear I would like to hear a couple of ideas that you have. I walked around the room and I saw many good ideas. I can't translate them, but when we transcribe them, you will see lots of ideas. But let's have a couple of ideas from those of you who came up and shared with shared within your group an idea for connecting anybody willing to share something from their group notice I, I would like to share this with you I know many professors say when they ask the question, no one answers. And one researcher discovered that professors are too quick and easy, quick to start talking again. Because if they're silent, they get nervous. And they discovered that if you just 
stay quiet long enough, someone will eventually answer. But I appreciate it. God. And uh, speak in Spanish again, please. And um, the wonderful translators will translate. Bueno, eh, nosotros eh, hablamos de as, hacer asociaciones previas. Eh, si quisiera que nos digan diga qué es lo que piensan o saben del tema antes de introducirlo. Um, That's a little complicated. Yes, but connecting, asking them, what do you already know? Absolutely. That's an excellent strategy. Uh, someone else? Okay. Bueno, lo que nosotros hacemos para ir relacionando los conocimientos es un diagnóstico previo de los te, de los del conocimiento que ellos tienen. Realizamos una lluvia de ideas. Y así mismo también le planteamos palabras para que puedan asociar o ejemplos de asociación. A su vez, también utilizamos el diccionario para la búsqueda de significados para que ellos también puedan asociar. ¿Puedes but to have a diagnostic exam and to help them look for the connections rather than just giving them the connections. You ask them in dictionaries in your discipline to find the connection. Excellent. How about one more idea? Ah, okay. Gracias. Nosotros buscamos eh, la manera de ejemplificar a través de roles o a través de mm, situaciones que permitan generar debate, mm, confrontación mm, e interactividad de, de esos conocimientos previos mm, que generen reflexión para que puedan ayudar a, a mejorar el, el nivel de profundización en el tema. What 
do you do to help to keep it in their long term memory? Make sense? Okay, so this is number four. What are your ideas for helping students remember what they learned? identificando, haciendo evaluaciones de todo el proceso. Es lo que hacen mis compañeras. En mi caso utilizo caricaturas porque es clase en la Caricaturas o palabras que conecten, fra hagan frases y después las utilizo. Gracias. Ok. 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 Back into English, and then have our translator translate it back into Spanish. So since you all understood her, and I understood her as well, we'll just move on to the next idea. But that was a very good uh, couple of ideas. Okay, some people in the back. Do they have a microphone? Buenos días. Bueno, junto con mis compañeros, adoptamos un par de ideas. Una de ellas es ayudarle a los niños a recordar a través de canciones, lo hacemos con los niños más pequeños del preescolar, de la básica primaria, les enseñamos canciones sobre las temáticas que se acaban de desarrollar, que ellos así las pueden recordar, e incluso la llevan a casa, y en la casa pueden tener esa, esa participación pues, con los padres. Eh, otra idea pues, son los mapas mentales, los mapas conceptuales, porque nos ayudan a recoger la información, sintetizarla en algo más pequeño, que ellos pueden pues, aprenderla y recurrir a, a ese mapa mental luego cuando quieren estudiar para el examen. Y otra de las ideas es eh, hacer una relación de la imagen con las letras que vamos enseñando a los niños de, del preescolar y de la básica. Por ejemplo, ellos tenían una dificultad con la, reconocer hacia dónde va la B y hacia dónde va la B y lo hicimos con, con los dedos, con su cuerpo. La mano derecha es la B la mano izquierda es la B y le hacemos imágenes. Este es un señor que toca un tambor y lo toca hacia la derecha. Este es un señor que toca un tambor y lo toca hacia la izquierda. Excelente. Excelente. Um, all of those ideas are wonderful ideas. Throughout history, in many different cultures, to remember the long oral histories of a group, they would set it to music because it helps remember. And the other ideas which you all heard were great as well. How about one last in the back since uh, uh, we're here and... Oh. Okay, we'll do one in the back there and then here and then we'll do it. Bueno, nosotros eh, lo que hacemos regularmente es un diálogo socrático para afianzar el conocimiento adquirido por el estudiante. Posteriormente se le pide que repita o explique con sus propias palabras lo que comprendió, es decir, a través de un parafraseo, y se le solicita al estudiante que dé sus propios ejemplos. Es decir, ahora construya el conocimiento con ejemplos propios, no que repita el ejemplo que el profesor ha utilizado. De esa manera se verifica que efectivamente él ha aprendido. Excellent. And then down here, 
uh, but having them put into their own words is like what I'm doing with my synthesis essay. They have to have it in their own language. And then to put it in even another example is a very, very good uh, strategy. Okay, last right here. Bueno, eh, a través de todo lo que estuvimos hablando en el anterior que estaba la asociación con muchas eh, vivencias que, que ellos tienen durante su vida, pues entonces yo creo que la mejor manera de resumir todos los otros ejemplos que han dado es básicamente que ellos viven siendo que se aprendió. Si les estamos enseñando algo, los ayudamos a que lo asocien con algo de su vida e inmediatamente, o bueno, posteriormente, hacer que realicen una vivencia con respecto a eso para afianzar lo que, pues, lo que ya habían enlazado, lo que ya habían asociado. If they can relate what they're learning in the classroom to their life outside of the classroom, it has more what we call relevance, more connection, and they're more interested. I know, for example, in math, many teachers try to show how could you use this in the outside world so that it makes it both seem more important to learn and so that they can remember longer. Excellent ideas, all of you. Uh, so the basic model is that engagement, or getting students to sustain and be interested in learning, requires that they care about it, that they are willing to invest the time and energy. And that's motivation. And that means that they have to value it and they have to expect that they will succeed it. The other part is active learning, which means that they have to be given activities that require them to take the new learning and connect it accurately to what they already know. Otherwise, it rests superficially on their brains and they will forget. So if it's part of their new understanding, they actually change the formatting of their brains and they will remember it. So there are three conditions that I believe help the synergy in that double helix. That one, the task has to be appropriately challenging. Now those of you that teach young students are probably familiar with the Russian theorist Lev Vygotsky, who coined the, frame, the, the phrase zone of proximal development, which means that learning occurs in that middle area where it's just beyond what you already know and understand, but it's still within reach. This supports both active learning and motivation. If it's too far out, it's too frustrating, and you don't, aren't motivated. If it's too easy, it's boring, and you're not motivated. Learning requires change and pushing beyond what you already know. Um, earlier, this group suggested using a, back, a variation of diagnostic exams or a back, we call it a background knowledge code, to see where students are. I don't know about your classes, But in my classes, I have students who are the children, well, they're adults now, teenagers, 18-year-olds. They are from, they are migrant workers on the farm and barely speak English. Sitting next to that student, I have this time in my class 
a physics professor from Stanford University. Those two will be at very different levels in terms of what they will find out. And I have everything in between, and always have. Um, oh dear, what does this mean? Is the lamp is about ready to go off? Woo! Okay, so here's what I do in my own classes. Warning, warning. <laughs> um, I have students pick and choose from what they are going to do. I say, this is what your options are in this class. But there are a few points for the easier tasks. There are more points for more complicated tasks. Some of my students need lots of basic activities, and the more advanced students can have fewer of those and more advanced subjects. For my students who tend to get bored, I offer what I call a wild card. So for this Stanford physics professor, I say, you see what we're learning, what would you propose would stretch you to a higher level of understanding? And then they propose a project, and if I agree, then I'll say, okay. So, number five for you is how do you help? You have classes, right, of many students. What do you do? to help each of those individuals work at an appropriately challenging level. This is a tough question, but please take that for number five. Let's see what a couple of ideas are. This gentleman here. Nosotros eh, digamos tres grupos en cada, cada o sea, los, los primeros que son los casos que tienen mayor ventaja, un grupo grande, que es un 80%, que está en el promedio, y un grupo escaso reducido, que son los que se cataloga como aquellos que han aceptado esta casa. Entonces, además de brindarles la asesoría permanente por parte del docente, se busca asignarles monitores o tutores eh, del grupo, del primer grupo para que ellos acompañen y ayuden a que eh, los conocimientos que transmite el docente sean más fácilmente entendibles por un par o por una persona muy similar a ellos para que durante todo el, el proceso se haga mayor efectivo en la transmisión. Y lo otro es brindarles diferentes eh, opciones evaluativas de acuerdo a, a las capacidades que tenga cada uno de los estudiantes, de pronto una evaluación oral, una evaluación escrita, una evaluación gráfica, que le permita a cada uno eh, potenciar su capacidad de entendimiento. entonces visuales también, entonces tratamos de variar muchas actividades que lo llamamos la salud audiovisuales, salidas de campo que les encanta, eh, que participen, que de cierta manera transformen el contenido, ya sea inventando canciones, poemas, 
De cierta manera tenemos en cuenta pues, esos estilos y ritmos de aprendizaje de cada uno. Bueno, vamos a una institución tecnológica. Nosotros lo que hacemos es aplicar una frase que dice que si le pides a un estudiante que haga lo que puede hacer, no hará nada. Pero si le pides que haga más de lo que puede hacer, lo hará. Desde esa perspectiva lo que hacemos es ponerle retos para que hagan cosas bastante interesantes, por ejemplo, desarrollos tecnológicos, y les decimos que si esos desarrollos tecnológicos tienen éxitos, pueden ser patentables o pueden llevar a un plan de negocio o a una empresa que finalmente les va a servir para la vida. Entonces de esta manera se motiva y da muy buenos resultados, muchachos. Okay, I'm hoping to capture the rest of them. The next condition that I think helps contribute to the synergy is building a sense of community. And in the keynote yesterday, I talked about how it seems particularly important to younger students today to be part of a group. Maybe that's always been the case, but researchers who are investigating today's younger students are saying that it is more important for today's students than ever before to feel connected to their group. And I think at the college level, and I would imagine at the high school level, you see that with all the texting, and all the social networking. And I wanted to share with you uh, what happens often when people come into the actual classroom. They are put separately like they are here, and they don't talk to each other. It sounds like many of you are already working with your students to make sure that they work together and that they feel like they're a sense of community. In my classes now, they are large, and I no longer am able to learn their names, which I know from the research is one of the most fundamental techniques for building community, is to be able to call students by their names. But in many college classes now, they're very large, and we can't. So what I have done is I formed all of my students into base groups that starts the first day of the term, and they stay all the way through. And then that helps because that's their sense of community. There is another technique which maybe some of you have done, which is in the collective learning book, and it's called test taking teams. And so in a test taking team, students first take their tests individually, and then they turn them into the teacher. And then the next step is before they receive their grade, they take the test as a group. And then they submit that test. And then their grade is some combination of the two. This is a very new technique at college. But many people are finding that it's very effective. Could you raise your hand if you already use this in your classes? Does anybody already use this in English? A few. Yeah. Excellent. But what, um, there's variations of it. Sometimes people have their groups. Be Sometimes the groups are study groups and they practice for the, the test together and take it individually and then together. Whatever their, their final grade is depends 
how much you value the individual versus the group. Um, <laughs> so, what do you do to help students feel comfortable, like they're part of the community? What techniques do you use in your classes so that students feel welcome as part of the community and not in the isolated community? So that's number six. And if you could put it on your six, it is all six. Okay. So again, maybe a couple of ideas. Um, all your wonderful ideas. So I see someone way in the back. If you can bring her in the microphone. Buenos días. Bueno, alguna de las actividades que hacemos para Buenos días. Una de las actividades que hacemos para hacer que primeramente el grupo desarrolle ese sentido de unidad del que se hablaba ahorita es presentarle algunas actividades a nivel grupal que les ayuden a ellos a sentirse unidos, que se empiecen a querer, que empiecen a respetarse dentro del aula de clase y luego a partir de eso crear algunas actividades o proyectos que ellos puedan llevar a otros cursos, a otros grados, para que ellos sientan que su trabajo es importante y que a través de lo que ellos hacen dentro de su misma aula de clases pueden impactar a otras personas, incluso de grados superiores al de ellos. Eh, también utilizamos pues, todo lo que tiene que ver con el medio que les rodea, lo que les gusta, la música, eh, sí, lo, las redes sociales, todo lo que hace parte de, de, de su mundo y lo llevamos pues a, a la práctica. Bueno, eh, acá el grupo eh, eh, hizo una referencia a una vieja técnica que se llama Pili 66 pero aplicada en, la, en el momento eh, que consiste en, en tres grandes, tres grandes digamos, eh, partes. La primera es en que se divide el grupo eh, aleatoriamente en, en, en grupos más pequeños según los temas que vayamos a tratar en el, en el curso. Eh, una, un primer compromiso para ellos es enseñar, el aprender, tienen que sacar conclusiones concretas de ese primer, de ese primer tema. Luego una segunda parte, en la misma hora o en, una, en, una, en un espacio diferente, ellos tienen que aprender a descubrir. Se toma un, un, eh, un, un, un actor de cada de los grupos y se vuelve a hacer la misma división. De tal manera que cada uno quede con un compromiso de enseñarle su tema a otra persona. Y por último se hace una gran plenaria donde todos tienen que... Eh, construir colectivamente el, el, el resumen del tema que se le va a plantear. Eso es un tema que se llama panel integrado, es una técnica. Hoy en día también se puede utilizar, eh, creo que recibe el nombre de World Café, de World Café que, es, que está, utilizado, está siendo utilizado ampliamente a nivel mundial. Sí, estoy familiar con esa técnica y es muy buena Thank you for sharing it here. So our last here, and again, again. Buenos días. Uh, one, one more time. Uh, thank you again for all your ideas, and make sure they're written down so that we can share them later. Buenos días. Nosotras, pues, a través de técnicas que nos conlleven a realizar un conjunto de actividades o experiencias de aprendizaje, involucrándolos en proyectos complejos y del mundo real. En el colegio tenemos una experiencia bastante enriquecedora. La profesora de ciencias cogió a los estudiantes desde el grado noveno hasta once y a cada uno le estipuló una fruta. 
y ellos con esta fruta tenían que hacer infinidades de cosas, ingeniárselas, gelatinas, dulces, galletas, y luego cada docente teníamos que evaluarlo a ellos, porque ellos nos explicaban de qué manera era el grupo, cómo lo habían hecho, cómo lo habían conformado, qué productos utilizaban, y además nos los vendían también. O sea, fue una experiencia enriquecedora. Aquí tenemos nuestra compañera y nos reíamos porque ellos se tomaron ese papel tan en serio que fueron hasta promotores, se volvieron microempresarios dentro del mismo colegio. Prior to the college level, are doing some very creative things in your classroom. I think you should write a book. <laughs> But anyway, we'll keep moving along here. Um, the last of the three conditions is to learn holistically. And many of the things that you are talking about address holistic learning. But let me back up to college professors, particularly, are very accustomed to thinking in the cognitive realm. And I think, even with all the creative things you are doing prior to college, when students come to the college or university, it's like, We don't pay attention to that, all those things anymore. It's just what you're thinking. But what researchers have found is that the brain operates in such a way that it is not just thinking. For example, emotions can overrule thinking in many cases. And you will have seen this with students who we say have math phobia or math anxiety. Those of you who teach math, students who come in and are so scared of it. I understand teachers say they spend most of their early work trying to get past that fear. And then they can work on it. I want to share with you my own personal experience here in Colombia. Because I don't know Spanish, I find myself in the restaurant of my hotel trying to do simple things, like get a bottle of water. And because I don't have the language, I find myself feeling so stupid. And I know I'm not stupid, but that's how I feel. And I'm so sorry I didn't learn more Spanish before coming here. And then when I get nervous and scared, I can't even remember to say gracias, which I know. And it's because my fear gets in the way. But I want you to know that everyone in the hotel, that's where I stay, has been so helpful. And it makes me feel very good about your country, Colombia. And I know that in the United States, we're often not very helpful to travelers. And I'm going to continue to try to be more helpful. So if you come to the United States, come visit me, and I will help you. <laughs> Is that if in addition to the thinking realm, 
We can help students develop in their emotional level to become more concerned about other humans, to understand themselves as humans, to manage anger, all of these things. The psychomotor domain, uh, when you talked about the fruit and what could they make with it, they're actually doing things. And that also is a way, know, know how, we will always remember how to ride a bicycle. Once you learn how, you can always ride a bicycle. That's a physical activity that helps and one remembers forever. The activity in the back of showing B and D with right and left hand, that's using a physical activity that a student can then connect it with that physical activity and always remember it. I also include the moral domain, though in many college classes, teachers would say, we don't need to be responsible for that. But my sense is that the world is in a very dangerous situation right now. And that everywhere we can, if we can help students develop the ethical and moral choices and their sense of responsibility as individuals within larger contexts, we will all benefit from students who grow up and make more moral choices because the world is tough and needs all the help we can get. In my own classes, I try to be holistic, for example, by using lots of media in my lectures. I have websites. I try to have students do a whole variety of things. Now, there are other ideas as well. But because of our time, we want to keep moving forward. So would you share your ideas for how do you help students learn holistically? Some of the ideas that you've already shared are holistic, but continue to think of new ways mm -hmm. that you get students to go across domains and learn as the whole human being. And that is number seven. Yes?
se pintaron de limo y ellos estaban felices, ellos, fue, fue una parte integradora porque ellos actuaban como mismo, o sea, los puse a que ellos actuaran como, como actuaron los mismos que ellos vieron en la película. Después que ya, que ya ellos actuaron, que ellos eh, eh, este, ya sabían lo que era un mismo, entonces eh, fui, fue cuando les mostré cómo era que se escribía la palabra mismo. Entonces, cuando ya yo quise llegar a, a esa última parte, ya yo sabía que era un mismo, cómo, cómo actuó un mismo, ellos ya, para ellos el, el aprendizaje fue significativo y eh, eh, nunca yo creo que se les va a olvidar la, la palabra. I agree. They will never forget it. Oh, that's an excellent activity. Okay, just one more because uh, we need to uh, move on. Bueno, eh, para esto de, que vamos a promover acá en este grupo, quería que usted nos ayudara con todo el auditorio. En primera instancia, a ver si todos nos ponemos de pie un momentito. Y, y que cada uno abra los brazos. Demos media vuelta y abrazamos a dos. Gracias.
ways that you could understand that information. I would, this book is translated into Spanish. This book is not. But I am not joking when I say you all should write a book. Maybe you should translate that book and add your stuff, and we can be authors together. I don't know, but I've been very impressed with all of your ideas. And the third goal was to build a knowledge repository. And from what I can see, you have done an excellent job for that. But they will see when they transcribe all of this what your ideas are. But I didn't want you to think that everything goes well for me. Last quarter, this student wrote to my supervisor. He said, I suffer through group project after group presentation, after painfully endless group discussion. This is the worst college class I've ever taken. Oh. She wrote that about me and sent it to all the administrators at the college. And of course, I was nervous again. But my boss, my supervisor, the new dean, called me in. And this time, instead of reading all the complaints, like they did when I first returned teaching, he wrote to me, oh, he also said, a sentiment shared by many of my peers, which was a way for him to say, not only do I think you're a terrible teacher, but all the rest of the students think you're a terrible teacher, too. I was very hurt. But my supervisor said, insulting your professor is contraindicated if you want to succeed in college. So he said to this student, saying such bad things about a professor is not going to get you very far in college. And I was very grateful. At any rate, this is another quote from uh, a thinker in the United States that is from the 19th century. And it is posted at Stanford University. And I read it recently, and I wanted to close sharing this with you. If ever there was a cause, if ever there can be a cause worthy to be upheld by all toil or sacrifice that the human heart can endure, it is the cause of education. As I look at the problems of the world, I think the only way we're going to solve that is to motivate students to get good education and to improve their lives, the lives of their families, their communities, their nations, the whole world. And so I commend you for choosing to be here today. And I thank you. Gracias, muchas gracias. a todos por su participación antes eh, de que se retiren dos cositas eh, de parte del, del CEDU y del Centro para la Excelencia Docente Uninorte eh, todo ese material que ustedes trabajaron hoy nosotros lo vamos a organizar y como todos han dejado su información de correo electrónico se lo vamos a enviar por correo electrónico se lo vamos a enviar junto con un enlace a una página de recursos pedagógicos que hemos venido trabajando acá en el Centro para la Excelencia Docente para que también ustedes puedan sacar provecho y hacer uso de este recurso. Ahora mismo eh, nuestros, eh, nuestro personal de apoyo está repartiendo unas evaluaciones eh, del evento de la Jornada de Innovación Pedagógica. Les agradecemos por favor su colaboración diligenciando esa, jornada, esa evaluación y cuando la culminen pueden proceder a salir del auditorio a reclamar su certificado de asistencia y también a entregar el formato de evaluación. Muchísimas gracias.